Good morning. My name is Chuck Riley. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Engineering and Computer Science, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this uh, leadership seminar we have this morning. Our speaker is Ray Lugo. He's the director of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's John H. Glenn Research Center in Cleveland. He's responsible for planning, organizing, directing the activities required in accomplishing the missions assigned to the Glenn Center. That center is engaged in research, technology, and systems development programs in space propulsion, space power, space communications, aeronautical propulsion, and microgravity sciences. Prior to this appointment, he served as Glenn's deputy director from 2007 to 2010. Previously, Mr. Lugo served as the deputy program manager of the Launch Services Program at NASA's Kennedy Space Center and was principally responsible for managing, directing, and evaluating the progress of all ongoing launch operations and activities in including expendable launch vehicles engineering and analysis, payload integration, launch site support, and launch campaigns. Mr. Lugo began his NASA career at Kennedy Space Center in 1975 as a cooperative education student. His first assignment was in the construction and modifications branch as an engineer responsible for construction modifications to Launch Complex 39A in preparation for the first space shuttle launch. Since becoming a member of the Senior Executive Service in 2001, he has served as the Executive Director of the Cape Canaveral Spaceport Management Office, Director and Deputy Director of Expendable Launch Vehicle Services Program, Manager of Facilities and Support Equipment Division in the Space Station Project Office, and Chief of the Business Office of the Joint Performance Management Office. Mr. Lugo has received numerous honors, including two NASA Exceptional Achievement Medals for contributions to the Galileo mission and the Space Station redesign, and three NASA Outstanding Leadership Medals for his instrumental role in the Expendable Launch Vehicle Program transition. Mr. Lugo earned a Bachelor of Science in Engineering in 1979 from the University of Central Florida and a Master's Degree in Engineering Management in 1982 from the Florida Institute of Technology. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ray Lugo. Oh, wow. Thank you. So I don't know if I can live up to all that. Uh, as you can see, I can't hardly hold a job. Uh, I've done quite a few things in my career, and hopefully a lot of you will get the, the same opportunities I've had. So um, let me kind of walk you through how we're going to do this. I'm using charts, not really to brief charts to you, but hopefully to be able to facilitate a conversation between us. And you know, it's my expectation that you know, at the end of this presentation, you can say it was time well spent as opposed to just killing time. So uh, that's my expectation. Um, I really expect you guys to ask hard questions, not easy ones. Um, so with that, I'm going to move on. The other thing, I don't know if Tim Cotner is in here, but if this thing goes well, make sure you tell Tim that it went well. If it doesn't go well, catch me afterwards and say, you know, you kind of didn't do such a good job. So this is a picture of the Glenn Research Center, and if you didn't know it, um, it's located uh, right next to the uh, Cleveland Hopkins Airport in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, it's the third oldest of the NASA centers. We just completed 70 years of existence. Some people will say, well, NASA's only been in existence for 50, and, and we actually trace our roots back to the um, uh, National um, uh, uh, Association for um, uh, Aeronautics that was formed actually before NASA came into existence. And part of that was under the uh, leadership of uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright. So let me tell you a little bit about my personal story. And I'm not going to tell you so much about um, my education, because that's pretty much public knowledge. But you know, I'd have to say this, as I was fortunate to be here uh, in, uh, at uh, UCF. And at the time I was here, it was actually called Florida Technological University. And I was uh, part of uh, President Milliken's problem trying to get all the students on board with uh, the name change. So I spent a little bit of time in his office, and, and, and uh, I would say it was an interesting time. But I actually ended up getting two diplomas instead of just one. So work something out of it. So in, uh, this, what I'm going to do is just use it really to kind of outline some of my experiences. I talk, uh, tell you a little bit about my experience when I first graduated from college recognize I got a degree in industrial engineering and the very first job I had as a um, as an engineer working for NASA was doing construction 
um, uh, of uh, ground systems and uh, ground system development at Kennedy Space Center. And so in that uh, job, I was responsible for the modifications of Launch Complex 39, which converted um, Launch Complex 39 from the capabilities to support an Apollo moon launch to support the launches of the space shuttle, which is a non-trivial um, uh, activity because during the Apollo program, the launch tower actually was connected to the mobile launcher platform, and we moved it from the vehicle assembly building with the rocket on the launch platform and set it down at the launch pad. Uh, what we did in the shuttle program was we put most of those uh, capabilities, we installed them on the launch pad, and then the only thing we moved out to the launch uh, pad was the shuttle stack on the launcher platform. So significant amount of construction work there, and you'd say, well, what does an industrial engineer bring to the table for that? And I would say to you, it's a pretty uh, complex network of operations you know, a lot of cost estimating it goes in there, and also, more importantly, making sure the work gets done. So that was my first job. Then I went on, and I did similar kind of work on modifying the crawler transporter, and then um, doing some testing of some of the systems at what we call the Launch Equipment Test Facility. I moved on from there in 1984 to work on shuttle payloads. You know, the shuttle first launched in 1981. We really weren't doing a whole lot of uh, work with taking things into space on the initial flights, but by 1983, we were actually launching a lot of commercial uh, satellites uh, in lieu of launching on, on expendable launch vehicles. So I went and worked in that area for about five years, and then I went to work in what we call the Payloads Project Control Office. And I got this highlighted in red because this is one of those kind of changes in my career that's pretty important for you guys to, to think about. Prior to this time, I had been doing pretty much engineering kind of work. When I went to work in the Projects Control Office, basically, I was now managing money and contracts. And I will share with you as an engineer, if you're, whether you're looking to be, go up a, what I'd call, a project management track or a technical track, or you want to go up a supervisory track, you're almost always going to have to be able to manage money and manage contracts. So this was my first exposure to that, and it really somewhat gave me a, a set of unique skills that separated me out from my peers and really kind of set me on course to where I am today. Now, the interesting thing about it, I don't know that in 1989 when I took that job, I could have told you that that would have set me up to be where I am today. So it's a really good thing for you guys to remember is that sometimes when you're asked to go do something that's way outside of your career field and way outside of what you were trained for as an undergraduate student, that those are still good opportunities to kind of broaden, uh, broaden yourself and kind of add some tools into your toolkit that will serve you well. From there, I went to work on the International Space Station and I was actually involved and the redesign of the space station um, back in 1994. I moved from there. Um, I had a great office. I was actually responsible on space station for developing the space station processing facility, all the equipment, uh, test equipment and ground support equipment that went into the facility. And uh, what I did, I did such a good job of creating that. I had about 13 people working for me at the time and I was able to actually get those people off doing everything that needed to be done. And I got to the point where I was looking for something else to do, and my boss suggested I go work in expendable launch vehicles. So I went uh, into that job as the uh, head of the engineering organization for expendable launch vehicles. Now, I want you to think again, industrial engineer, I got a bunch of computer engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, all guys that did different things than I did as an undergraduate yet, I'm the guy who's providing them the direction on what they need to be doing. Shortly after I got there, the guy I was working for got sick, had a, a mild heart attack, and not only was I doing the engineering job, but I became the launch director for expendable launch vehicles, did about 16 launches. And again, you would never think about somebody with a background in industrial engineering doing that, but my point to you is, particularly here at UCF, we're getting uh, a really good grounding in engineering, not necessarily in um, structures engineering or you know, optics, but we have a good enough grounding in engineering that we can do those kinds of things. So I have always felt like the education I got here at UCF 
was particularly valuable to me as I've progressed through my career. So the big thing that happened there was NASA made a decision that they wanted to take the management of launch vehicles, of expendable launch vehicles, and those are things like the Atlas and the Delta rockets and Pegasus, and they wanted to consolidate it all in one place because at the time we had about 300 civil servants and probably 1,000 um, contractors working all over the country, and the sense was they all come to Kennedy to launch anyway, so why don't we consolidate the management of those operations at Kennedy and see what kind of efficiencies we could gain. So we ended up moving that function down and reducing down to about 150 civil service uh, engineers and about 250 contractor engineers, so a significant savings. And we did 50 consecutive launches, actually 53 consecutive launches, before we had a failure. And that's not a trivial thing. It was a you know, very high uh, uh, level of performance in an area where you only get about 97% uh, or so uh, uh, success rate, we were for better than five years, you know, had 100% success rate. So I was responsible for consolidating that program at Kennedy. Um, I was then asked to go do uh, a different job. Um, and this was the Joint Base Operations contract, which was the contract that really runs the institutional functions for the Kennedy Space Center and Patrick Air Force Base. So I was managing about a $250 million a year contract with about 3,000 employees that did everything from maintaining buildings to medical services to life support to uh, propellants uh, work, security, um, fire, all the things it takes to run an installation. So I was kind of like the mayor or the city uh, manager of the Kennedy Space Center and the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And that, again, gave me a very unique set of skills that further differentiated me from my peers because now not only did I have a business and contracts uh, set of experiences and an engineering set of experiences, but I had the full breadth of the things it takes to lead and manage a big installation. So that was a, a great opportunity. So then in 2002, I returned back to the launch services program. And then from there in 2007, um, I had just turned 50 years old. Uh, I wasn't having a midlife crisis, but I really was thinking to some extent, you know, hey, I've kind of done all the things that could be done at the Kennedy Space Center, and I'm saying, hey, in the next five or six years, I might like to retire and do something else. So do I want to go maybe take a risk and try something different? And so I went kind of crazy and moved to Cleveland as a deputy director of Glenn Research Center. And then in 2010, I was uh, named director. So that's kind of my um, uh, professional experience. So I joined NASA as a co-op in the 70s. Um, UCF, there weren't any parking garages that I can recall at that time. There were some dirt places that they ticketed you if you weren't in the right place. Um, so anyways, it was kind of an interesting thing. But at that time, uh, we had just completed the Apollo moon program. It was about in 1973 we had our last Apollo moon launch. And um, we were getting ready to launch this thing called ASTP, which was the Apollo Soyuz test project, which was the first time the US and Russians had any cooperation in space to that point in time. Prior to that point in time, we'd been in this space race. And in 1975, we launched uh, ASTP, and it was you know, a collaboration in space. And I think it really kind of changed the tenor between the two countries about cooperation in space. And we were, we were actually doing all the hard work of designing and developing the space shuttle, which was going to be the first reusable launch vehicle. Domestically, we had a lot of the same kind of problems we're seeing today. Now, I talk about gasoline being like 35 cents a gallon and go into a buck and buck 35. Obviously, it's close to $5 a gallon now, right? Uh, $4, I guess. It's $4.20 or so. Um, so similar kind of energy issues, but the bigger problem back then was you could actually go to a gas station and not find gas, okay? So you got kind of used to paying more than you felt like you should pay, making sure you kept your gas tank full. Um, there was a lot of inflation and economic uncertainty in the country. Um, mortgage rates, unlike today, that are fairly low, 
were very, very high, and people were having a hard time buying homes. And uh, at that time, there were a lot of people who had confidence that NASA could maybe be uh, brought to bear to solve some of these tough problems. And, you know, my point there is this whole thing about a call for innovation. And, you know, I think that's become a kind of a very commonly used term here today, right? So uh, the big challenges we had were to build a launch system to, la to basically fly 50 times a year. They were actually looking at um, a shuttle launch once a week, okay? We were actually looking for greater than once a week, but I want you to think about it. Um, that 50 launches a year is probably more launches than has happened in this country in the last five years. And we were looking at launching basically once a week with the space shuttle. And that was the original uh, goal, reusable, and the reason for reusability was obviously, you know, the things that it takes to fly in space are very expensive. And the feeling was if we could just reuse them, we would um, reduce the cost. And, and that's somewhat um, the whole idea of operating like an airline. Um, we wanted to reduce the cost per flight. Um, the uh, Saturn V moon rocket was probably seven to eight hundred million dollars a copy. You know, the ex ex expectation was we would fly uh, the space shuttle for maybe 60, 70 million a flight. And then the other thing we wanted to do was build a system that not only pr uh, provided transportation, but could be an on-orbit lab. So we accomplished some of those goals, and, um, but we didn't accomplish them uh, all, but we did actually accomplish a few other things. So some of the things that we actually did accomplish was uh, creating the world's highest performance LOX LH2 engine. And if you uh, don't know much about the shuttle uh, main engine, uh, you ought to learn a little bit about it. it is a, it's a marvel of engineering, the fact that we never had an in-flight failure of the SSME. And when I say a failure, we had an early shutdown. But bottom line is uh, we were really worried that the engine would come apart in flight, and that never happened. Um, we established uh, a pr fairly routine uh, access to space with the space shuttle. We got up a few years to about eight flights per year. We probably averaged uh, when we were flying about six. But if you look at over the uh, life of the shuttle program, it was greater than four flights per year. Um, and we've got over 1,500 technologies that have been attributed to the space shuttle program, things like the artificial heart, advanced in insulation materials, infrared thermometers, um, basically, these, all these innovations were um, the result of uh, NASA, NASA engineers and scientists and their support contractors. So, you know, one thing about, uh, you know, we talk a lot about innovation, and some people, I think, confuse innovation with invention. You know, invention is when you sit in a lab and create something that's never been created before, right? Innovation is maybe taking things that have already been created and applying them in a new or unique way and getting a, a product or service that never existed before. And I'll give you a good example. Some people would, uh, would argue that PayPal is uh, you know, a great innovation, and it is, but think about it. We could do online um, a payment for things pr long before PayPal existed, right? What PayPal did is they created a different business model, okay? He took things that already existed, and this is Elon Musk, um, he just took things that existed and he packaged it in a way that created a value-added service. So don't allow yourself to get too wrapped around the axle about you're not smart enough to innovate, because you are. You know, everybody innovates pretty much every day. When you, when you, when you end up on the side of the road and your car isn't working, you know, because it's got a broken hose, the first guy that said, hey, I'm going to take a little bit of electrical tape and wrap it around that hose and get home, well, that was, an, that was not the original thought behind electrical tape. Nobody ever really thought of it fixing a uh, radiator hose to get you home. So my point to you is we all innovate, and the good thing is here at UCF, there's a, uh, you know, a, a, basically a resource that's available for you for the rest of your life to help you develop the tools that you're going to need to be innovative throughout your career. So my point to you is you really need to take advantage of these uh, resources that exist. Okay, so what have I learned? First and most importantly is you can't stop learning. And learning happens in a lot of ways, but for me, I try to read everything that people put in front of me. Now, that's a, 
I can be both a, a positive and a negative because I spend a lot of time reading. But um, I don't care whether it's a technical journal or a newspaper or a book. You know, some books are on soft skills like leadership. But my point to you is, you know, you really need to think about, um, you know, a lifelong uh, learning um, agenda for yourself. And, you know, spend time building your skills, spend time improving your capabilities because that's going to be critically important. The next thing, take a few risks. And when I say take risk, I'm not asking you to drive fast or, you know, jump out of airplanes with parachutes. I'm suggesting to you to do things that feel a little bit uncomfortable. And, you know, it's really hard for engineers to do that, okay? As engineers, we always are calculating, okay, what's the likelihood of success if I do this? My point to you is don't get so uh, wrapped up into doing these calculations that you don't take a few uh, chances, not only, um, you know, technical chances, but chances with your own careers and your own lives. Um, I would tell you that um, every time I took a little bit of a detour or a chance, it ended up uh, really giving me a lot more back. And uh, once I got past the fear of taking the risk, it was great. Um, you need to work on building relationships and, more importantly, fixing any relationship you may have that's broken. And I can speak to that directly because, you know, as I went up through my career, I kind of got to the place where I figured, hey, I can do this all on my own. Well, let me tell you what, I, ha I had a boss that once told me, he sent me to Harvard in 1994, he says, you know, you're the best one-man army I got. He says, I need to build you to be a leader of armies. And, and if you think about it, if you're able to lead a group of people, you know, you can multiply your capabilities by however many people are willing to follow you. So it's a really important thing. Um, another thing my boss once told me, he says, be good at something. It doesn't really matter what you're good at, but you need to have something that in your organization people say, you know what, Joe is the best guy at this. Because that gives you, uh, you know, somewhat a power over your peers. They're going to come seek your advice, seek your counsel, um, look for your input on things they're doing that relate to something you're really good at. And that's really, really important. I tell people, you know, don't always be looking uh, to climb the ladder. You know, sometimes it's really important to uh, kind of go horizontal and, and really get deep in an area so that you establish yourself as an expert in some given area. Um, trust your managers. Now that I am a manager, I can't tell you how important this is, but um, I kind of have this rule about if it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical, then you ought to do it. And if you can't do that, then I think you're probably in the wrong place and you need to go find something else to do. And, and here's why that's critically important. Um, I've never been one to just blindly follow an order from my boss. I'll generally ask him, okay, you want me to do this, why? What is it, how does it help us, you know, m advance the organization, achieve a goal that we have uh, all agreed on? So you ought to ask those questions. But once you've gotten past that, there comes a, uh, what I would say, a responsibility on your part to basically do what your boss needs, needs you to do. And um, my point to you is it's not about blind uh, uh, compliance. It's, you know, you ask the questions, but if it passes that test, and my point to you is you probably need to just, you know, do it. And if you can't, then my, my rule is the day that I can't do that, then I'm really to the place where I need to be doing something else. Okay, taking on all opportunities. Um, I would share with you this is the probably, if there's one thing you leave here, with today, take this away with you because um, you're going to get offered opportunities probably from the day you start your first job. And some of them are going to look like, I don't understand why the boss wants me to, you know, take tickets at this event. Well, here's, here's the first thing. The boss is first trying to say, hey, is this person willing to follow me and do what I need him to do, right? But more importantly, you never know when the opportunity that you're given is going to be the opportunity that changes the trajectory of your career. And I'll give you a good example. When I went to Glenn in 2007, I went there because the person who was the director had been the deputy center director at the Kennedy Space Center. 
okay? And he calls me up while I was still at Kennedy, and he was the deputy center director at Kennedy, and he says, I want you to lead the combined federal campaign for the center this year. And I'm saying to myself, you know, I really got way better things to do than to lead the United Way campaign. But I said, you know, the boss is asking me to do something. I, you know, it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical. I need to do it. So I went off and did it, and we ended up raising more money than we had ever raised in our United Way campaign at Kennedy um, to that point in time. So that was back in like 2004. So in 2007, he picks up the call, uh, phone and asks me, you know, to come up and be his deputy at Glenn Research Center. So, you know, what I'm telling you is I don't know that I could have connected the dots with leading a, um, a campaign for uh, United Way, and the combined federal campaign is a civil service equivalent of the United Way. I couldn't have related that and being deputy center director at Glenn Research Center in 2007. So this is really something you need to think about. And finally, and this is something I would tell you, is that each one of you can lead even today. You know, you're going to lead, you know, your study group, you're going to lead your senior project, you know, you're going to go into work and the first few days you're going to probably lead the group of people who start the same day you do. And my point to you is there's all kinds of leadership. Leadership doesn't necessarily be in the guy or gal who's barking all the orders, right? Leadership is recognizing how you can contribute to the, you know, the goal or the achievement of the goal of the group you're in. So always remember that as a leader, it's important to know when you need to be the guy or gal barking the orders, and it's also important to know when you need to let somebody else assume that leadership position and just bring your skills and capabilities to the table. Okay, a lot of people confuse leadership and management. Management is about getting people to do things right, okay? So it's about quality, it's about spending the right amount of money, it's about spending the right amount of time. It's those things which um, are about, you know, doing things right. Whereas leadership is about getting people to do the right thing. And that's uh, sometimes a lot harder thing to do than the first. Um, you need to know the difference. Most importantly, you need to know that there are times that as a leader, you're going to have to make some decisions that don't feel very good. And the fact that it doesn't feel very good doesn't mean it isn't right. It's just probably uh, those are the ones that test your character the most. And it's, al it's not always about feeling good. Um, I would tell you there are probably days I go home when I have to make a decision that um, you know, I'm just beating myself up about why did I have to make the decision. And some of those decisions are, do you discipline an employee? Do you end up having to uh, terminate a project and as a result um, terminate some employees? And the key thing is, is to make sure you're asking yourself the question, and this is the question I ask myself, am I making this decision or taking this action because I will look good? And if you think about it, sometimes people do or say the politically correct thing because of how they will appear versus is it the right thing to do? And you ought to get used to asking yourself that question because it's a really good test of when you've crossed that line about am I doing this because I'm going to, you know, appear to my management or to my peer group as somebody who's doing the right thing as opposed to actually maybe having some criticism from either your leadership or your uh, peer group because the decision you made was particularly difficult. So, be a leader at any level. Um, I would tell you, you got to have a vision. And a lot of people get hung up on this term vision. I was hung up on it for a long time. I thought I had to be like Mahatma Gandhi or somebody, you know, create this, you know, grand vision of, you know, peace in the world. And frankly, a vision is, is in my mind, is just being able to clearly say where it is you want to go, what you want to accomplish, what results you want. And you need to, uh, to be able to articulate it. So you need to work on some of those softer skills on, you know, writing and, and speech. So, you know, while you have the opportunity here at the university, take advantage of these things because engineers that can, can speak well 
Engineers that can write well are always going to be more successful than those that can't. Um, be passionate. Now, I want you to, you know, a lot of people get confused about the word passion. The Latin root of the word passion is to suffer. And I, I'll share this with you. You're going to suffer, and probably some of your people are going to suffer as a result of some of the things you're going to want to do. But if it's something that's really important, if it's something that really is going to make a difference, you're going to have that feeling in your gut that's going to, you know, it's going to, it's going to emanate from you, and it's going to be something you're going to, it's going to be infectious to the people who are around you. So, you know, be passionate about what you do. And if you're not passionate, it's, again, another good sign that maybe you need to be looking at what you're doing and, uh, you know, maybe even, you know, the job you've got. Um, you got to believe. If you don't believe in what you're trying to do or what you're trying to accomplish, nobody's going to believe you. Okay, so you have to, you know, not only uh, talk it, but you've got to model it every day. And uh, people, people will read through it when they can see that, hey, you're not really a believer in what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. And then finally, you've got to commit. And um, I was in a class here a couple of weeks ago, and I, and I finally got the best clarity on the whole word commitment. But a commitment without a conscious decision is an obligation. And an obligation is something that, you know, you feel in your gut that you have to do, but it isn't the same as a commitment, okay? A commitment is a conscious decision. And you need to think about when you're getting ready to do things about going through a process where you not only commit to yourself, but you commit to the people you're working to, we're working with. And finally, commitment's going to look different and feel different to different people. If you want the commitment that you want, you've got to model that behavior. Okay, respect. You know, I think you guys all know this. It's, you know, it's earned, it's never given. Once you lose it, it's hard to get it back. If you want it, again, you've got to model the behavior. You've got to be a respectful person. Um, and then something to remember, if you do openly disrespect somebody, you better openly uh, make sure you square it up with them. And, you know, that means sometimes uh, standing in front of a group of people and saying, you know, what I did, what I said, my behavior, my actions were disrespectful, and you've got to own it. And that'll, that'll go a long way to rebuilding that respect. Uh, relationships, it's really important. You'll hear this a lot throughout your career. You know, a lot of people think relationships are a 50-50 proposition. Um, probably the best explanation I ever got on a relationship was when I was at Harvard in 94. And um, it was the first time I really understood what a relationship was. And uh, what the way it was explained to me was uh, if you take 100 transactions that you're doing with somebody in business, uh, a relationship is about on 90 of those transactions, both you and the person you're having this business relationship are going to make money. And there's going to be five of those transactions where your the partner, your person you're in this relationship with, is going to make money and you're going to break even. Okay? And then there's going to be three or four that you're going to have where both of you are going to break even. And then there's going to be the one where your partner breaks even and you lose a lot of money. Okay? And that's what a relationship is about is always making sure that you keep the person you're in this relationship whole, okay? And, and it's hard sometimes to really get okay with that, but if you don't go into it thinking about it that way, it's real easy to do the thing that can really uh, damage a relationship and make it, uh, and get it to a place where it can't ever be repaired. Uh, okay, so life lessons. <laughs> You know, one thing about it, and, and I think if you talk to Dr. Cotner, he'd tell you, I've made every mistake that can be made. Uh, hopefully, I've only made it once. I may have done a, made a few twice, but I definitely never go for the third time. So, learn to take criticism. Uh, it's the hardest thing you can do. You know, the last thing you want to do is sit in front of, you know, sit with somebody and have them tell, you know, this thing you did really didn't work, and here's why. And, and what you have to do, and, and this is what you, you're going to have to learn, is just take it in. Because most of the time, 
uh, it really represents their truth, okay? And they come, every person in this room comes with a set of values, a set of perceptions uh, on life. And so they're going to give you their, their feedback based on where they're at and how they felt and what their emotions were based on what you either said or did. And my point to you is it's got to be, you've got to learn to take it as just information. You can't allow yourself to be constantly defending what you did or what you said. You need to take it in and hear it and recognize that if one person felt that way about what you said or did, then there's a possibility that somebody else felt the same way. And ask yourself, could you have phrased it differently? Could you have um, maybe your body language been a little bit different? Um, could you have done something differently that might have changed that whole interaction? So just really learn to take criticism. Um, I would also share with you, you need to learn to roll with the punches. Um, and my point on that is nothing's ever going to uh, go totally your way. And you can't allow yourself to get um, you know, uh, derailed for every little bump in the road that comes along. People are always watching. Uh, and when I, when I say that, it'll be people beneath you, your peers, your, you know, your supervisors and leaders. They're always watching. And more importantly, they're, they're wanting to see how does so-and-so behave when they've had a victory? How does so-and-so behave when they've had a defeat? You know? And most importantly, they want to know not only are you gracious in victory, but that you can you know, pick yourself up and move on from a, from a bad situation. And I can tell you, that that's, for me, that's probably one of the things that, um, that I realized fairly, uh, you know, I was at Kennedy and uh, I had uh, been doing a job for a better part of two years. So then there had been some, they made some inquiries and looked at uh, some people to take the job who were, you know, more senior than I was. But then they finally competed the job, and, um, and I got to the day of the interview, and um, I'm sitting across the table from the person who's going to be doing the interview, and he's doing this across the table. And I'm sitting there in a golf shirt, and I'm saying, what the heck's that all about? So after the meeting, I go up to him. I said, okay, what's this thing about? And he said, well, he says, you're not dressed for your interview today. And I'm saying, what interview? <laughs> so... Uh, so he says, well, you've got an interview for the job here in an hour, blah, blah, blah. So I'm freaking out, okay? Get, get in my car, drive home. As I'm driving home, uh, a contractor we were working with that was having a problem was talking my ear off, and I'm saying to myself, you know, I really like to tell this guy I'm too busy to talk to him, but I said, no, you know, I need to, to work through it. So talking to him, I finally get home. I said, hey, i got to get in, get changed. So shower, shave, change. Get back in the car, the guy calls me back. So I show up for the interview, and I'll be honest with you, I did a terrible job on this interview. And um, it was probably, I don't know, six weeks later, I finally find, found out that a guy that worked for me got selected for the job. Okay, So you want to talk about being crushed? I was pretty crushed, and I was really mad. And I was mad at my boss and I was mad at the system because I felt like, hey, I hadn't been treated fairly in this whole thing, right? And um, so I took two weeks off because I was really mad. And, um, and over that two weeks, I, you know, I came to a realization that I had a choice. I could either stay mad and pretty much end my career at the level I was at. And, you know, frankly, I was doing pretty good as compared to the average bear. Or... I could just get over it and move on. And so that's what I decided to do. I said, hey, you know, uh, I'm bigger than this thing. And, you know, maybe, you know, I had to take ownership for the fact that, hey, I wasn't well prepared and I didn't do very well in the interview. And that's a hard thing to do when you feel like you've been treated unfairly, right? But it's really important. And so I, you know, to kind of cut the story short here, when I finally got selected for that next level job, one of the things um, the person who selected me told me was that what really impressed him was how I behaved following that big disappointment, and he knew it was a big disappointment. So I just want you to you know, really 
give that some consideration, you know, is that people are always watching, and it's not only important to be, you know, gracious when you win, but you really need to find a way to, uh, to be just as gracious when you lose. Um, don't get overconfident. You know, um, people who know me would tell you, hey, he's a confident guy. Well, I, I have more self-doubt probably than, you know, this whole room, okay? And, and the reason why is because a lot of times the decisions you make are pretty important, okay? You know, if you make a wrong decision working on a space shuttle program, people can die, right? If you make the wrong decision building a building, you can spend a lot of extra money. So you don't want to be overconfident, but you don't also want to allow yourself to get into a situation where you're spending so much time analyzing every little piece of trivial data that doesn't really matter that you don't make a decision. So my point is, and I think I've read this somewhere, is if you've got 80% of the information, you've got more information than you need, okay? And I would argue that you make a decision and you keep an eye on the decision you made because what you've done when you make the decision is you've started the ball rolling, right? Once the ball's rolling, it's pretty easy to adjust the direction a little bit, right? But it's getting the ball rolling that's the hard part. So don't be overconfident, but also don't allow yourself to spend too much time analyzing data and the situation. Okay, so we talked about the self-doubt. I talked about adjusting the, uh, the direction. Another point is don't live a life of regrets. And I've been asked this question probably a hundred times in interviews. What do you regret in your career? And my answer, I don't regret anything, okay? Every decision I made, you know, there's some of them I would probably make differently. Okay, knowing what I know today, I would make some of those decisions differently. But I'm not, you know, I learned everything, I learned things even from those bad decisions, right? So why would I regret the fact that I made a decision that maybe wasn't the best, but I learned something from? It was an education. And then most of the time, those things are correctable. So I learned from it and I moved on and I was able not to make that same decision or make that, you know, take that same action and I got better uh, because of it. So my point is don't, don't regret what you do in life. You know, try to learn from what you've done. Okay, so about people. And this, is, this to me uh, is probably the thing. I, if I do one thing well, I think I do people well, okay? And if you guys want to be leaders, managers, you know, heads of organizations, you better get really good at this whole thing about managing, developing, training, retaining uh, people. Um, when I recruit, I look for the whole person. So I'm not necessarily always looking for a 4.0 grade point average, okay? In fact, I can tell you one of the best hires that I ever made in my career was a young man who had a 3.0 grade point average who ended up having three jobs to support himself and put himself through school and, oh, by the way, he led a pretty significant organization on, the, on site at the university. He did all of those things and he still had a 3.0 average. And my point to you is you got to look at what's going on in, the, in a person and what's going on in their life. You can't just necessarily look at the academic record and have a good sense for who, who a person is. So I always look for a, a whole person. Um, I want somebody who is comfortable in strange situations because particularly if I'm hiring somebody out of a university, I'm going to put you in a strange situation the first day on the job, right? And what I want you to do is be comfortable enough to meet everybody in your office and, you know, find out a little bit about what they do so that you can now build the relationships you need to learn the new job you have. So I do want people who are socially comfortable. And I want somebody who's willing to take a few risks. Um, so as far as training, and some of this is on you and some of this is on your leadership team. But I want people who, who are constantly wanting to learn. So people who want to go take a, a graduate level course or a short course uh, somewhere. Or, you know, they ask, hey, can I buy this online training class? You always want to be looking at ways to improve yourself. And it's important not only that you keep an eye on that, but you should be working for people who value that. Um, Obviously, technical training is important, but the soft skills are important as well. 
promotion. Um, hey, you know, it's uh, you, what you'd like to believe is you're in an organization that promotes excellence. Um, and also remind yourself that uh, you want to, uh, you know, basically, uh, if you're surrounding yourself with people that are constantly agreeing with you, and we have a name for that that we don't need to, to use in this uh, forum, then probably one or more of you is redundant, and I can assure you that your boss doesn't think he's redundant, okay, or she's redundant. And then finally, with respect to, uh, to retaining, you know, you should value a supervisor, manager, leader who's willing to give you, you know, really good feedback. Uh, you want to make sure uh, that you're, you know, being taken care of, and that means if you're in a pr uh, career ladder position that you're getting your promotions and you're getting your feedback from your supervisor when you need to. And the other thing is, if your supervisor kind of nudges you out of the nest one day, that doesn't mean they don't like you. To the contrary, I'm one of these people who believe that sometimes to really develop a person, you need to help them see the door and see the opportunities that exist outside that door. Mentors, um, you know, I've never, you know, mentorship has kind of become, uh, you know, a cult thing these days. You know, there are some people that, um, you know, constantly seeking a mentor. And, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I'd share with you, I've never been one that's good to having somebody following me around for a whole day or, you know, or scheduling a regular um, sit down with them. I'm better at, hey, um, if something, if we're doing something together, if you catch me afterwards and you say, hey, can you tell me what happened in there? Can you explain to me how you made the decision? Um, so mentors come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, and uh, you need to accept that. Um, and then, like I said, I do on-the-fly mentoring, and I, uh, you know, but I also schedule, you know, people schedule time with me, I'll do that. An important thing is if you're looking for somebody to mentor you, and they're giving you some, you know, some feedback or you know, some thoughts for things you ought to be doing. The last thing you want to do is not take their advice. Okay. I, I don't know what drives me crazier than for somebody to, you know, come in and say, "Hey, I want you to mentor me," and two years later they're still doing the same things that I told them they shouldn't be doing. Okay. So keep that into uh, in mind also. Um, Another thing is there can be other types of mentors. Everybody always focuses on the, you know, the fuzzy, warm, fuzzy, you know, great person kind of mentor. I also had some mentors, people that uh, I would say I consciously decided there were uh, personality traits or behaviors that they had that I did not want to model. And those sometimes are just as important as the ones that you do want to model. And the reason being, it gives you the ability to see how those behaviors, how those actions play out and affect an organization. Okay, so don't uh, necessarily uh, avoid people who kind of model some behaviors you don't, you know, particularly care for. Don't don't get discouraged if the people you want to mentor you kind of are not. Uh, you know, embracing your uh, requests initially. A lot of times what a mentor uh, will be looking for is trying to make a, a judgment on, okay, if I invest time and effort in this person, is it going to make a difference? And then really important is if you have a mentor, somebody you really believe in and has really helped you, acknowledge that, but be careful about hero worship because it comes off kind of odd in the workplace. Uh, reading. Um, I read a lot, and I read a lot of different things, and I've given you a few books to consider. Um, the one that didn't make this list, and I guess I should have probably updated it, um, if you've never read, uh, there's two books that uh, detail the uh, trip of um, Shackleton to uh, the South Pole. One's called Endeavor, the other one's called South. If you want to read a, a book about leadership, um, either one of those books will tell you what it's like to be a leader when a bunch of people's lives are on the line. But these are uh, a good list of books, uh, different ones. Um, the Fifth Discipline, really good book if you want to um, lead an organization. And organizations that are learning organizations tend to be highest performing organizations. Um, I would tell you read uh, 
Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, Team of Rivals, probably the best book on Lincoln and leadership I've ever read. So here's a few parting thoughts, and then we'll get into some question and answer. Um, first thing is, you've got a choice every day. Um, you can be present, you can be engaged, you can be decisive. You know, life is really about living. And um, if you're just checked out all the time, you're missing out on a lot of things. Um, take some time to reflect and pat yourself on the back for good things you do. Um, people who know me will tell you I never do that. But it's something that I think you need to do because there's going to be plenty of people standing around that are wanting to kick you in the back end. So, you know, uh, give yourself a break. And when you've done something or accomplished something that's uh, good or you've been selected for a promotion or whatever, take a few minutes and acknowledge, hey, you did something good. Um, take some people along for the ride. Uh, it's something that I've done throughout my career. Um, it's, you know, if you're climbing the ladder to the top and you're doing it by yourself, it gets awful lonely. What it would be nice is if you uh, drug a few people along with you. Uh, and then most importantly, and I, I would tell you this is something I try to do every day, is people that are important to you in your life, whether it's at home or at work or wherever, your family, make sure they know how much you appreciate them and how important it is that they're there for you. And if uh, any of this is stuck at all, we've reached the end, and hopefully we can have some com uh, uh, questions and uh, continue this dialogue. Can you uh, tell us about uh, some of the, the difficult decisions you've had to make in your career? Uh, for example, a, a decision to maybe move a, in a lateral role rather than a forward role. Did, yeah. did you ever, is it ever good to take a step back? Actually, I, I don't know. See, taking a step back, uh, a lot of people look at laterals as almost taking a step back, right? And I probably move sideways as much as I moved up. Um, and, and so here's what I'd tell you. I was, um, back in 2002, I was what we call at NASA a first-line director running the JBOSS contract. And I went from there to take the deputy position in launch services. And some people would say, well, why would you do that? Well, the reason I did that was because I felt like I could really contribute to the mission of launch services um, and impact the agency more doing that than staying in the position I was in, even though I was at one level higher, right? So, um, you know, I would share with you, don't get hung up on where you're at in the org chart. Um, ask yourself whether you're contributing to the mission of the organization, contributing to achieving a difficult goal, because at the end of the day, that's really uh, the medium of exchange that m managers, leaders look for out of their people is, are you willing to set your own personal, um, you know, title kind of goals aside um, to help the organization succeed? So, uh, you know, it's probably happened a couple of times in my career, and I actually have an employee who works for me right now who I'm having that difficult conversation with because I brought him up on my staff and so now he wants to be at one level higher. Well, that's not necessarily going to happen and I keep trying to explain to him, okay, what you need to do is get back into the line organization and you need to build those, rebuild your relationship with your peer set because if they don't accept you in that next position higher, you're going to have a hard time being successful. So that's at least one experience I had. Along the same line, how yeah. do you deal with difficult people? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I get an F in dealing with difficult people. Um, so here's what I, I would tell you. I've taken, um, uh, I have a prof had several coaches in my career. Dealing with difficult people, uh, you know, first off, uh, one of the things I've learned here recently is when you get irritated or get mad at what somebody says, it's not about them, it's about you. Okay, because you're the person that's reacting. Okay, so you have to try to see if you can uh, understand what are your triggers. Okay, for me, I have a, a trigger which is impatience. So if somebody is sitting up there droning on briefing me, I'm automatically like spinning up. Okay, <clears throat> so recognizing that I'm impatient, I then got to start focusing on okay, what is it this person needs from me to feel whole? Okay. And what they're probably needing from me is they want my attention, right? 
and they want me to be, you know, uh, emphat emphatic or empathetic uh, with respect to what they're trying to tell me. So I need to be a good listener and, and, and that. But when you get to a place, there's going to be a handful of people in your life that is just going to be near impossible to find a way to make, make things work out. And um, so what I do in those cases, <clears throat> I just go in and say, hey, we've got a, you know, work to accomplish. And let's just focus on conversations that relate to the things that I either need from you or you need from me and try to stay out of all those other places that tend to derail conversations. And, but I, I'm going to tell you, you know, dealing with difficult people, you know, you can take all kinds of training on how you, you know, make the environment safe and how you make that people, person or, or people feel better about the situation. At the end of the day, if the other party doesn't want to engage in a positive relationship, it's going to be really hard. And uh, you just got, all you can do is manage your own behaviors, your own uh, emotions, and try to make the best of it that you can. You know, I'm not saying that's in every case, but there's definitely going to be that small fraction of cases where you just got to accept that it's not going to be easy. So. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank you. you.